Mukam karoti vachalam pangum langhaya te giring yat krepa tamam vande paramananda madhavam. Yes, we are still in the Sankhya and Yoga chapter, chapter number two, which is the most philosophical. Mm, chapter and we had a v- quite intense discussions on our website very beautiful expositions by Siegfried very lovely nearly experiential you could feel the, the presence of Purushottama which cannot be um, known only can be experienced in a way um, so today we, I wanted to read some um, kind of other chapters, starting from 20s onwards. Uh, so sorry, shlokas, and in from the second chapter, and also to look into the sankhya and yoga, to do the sankhya system, because many of you do not know much about it, and that is the basic system of Indian philosophy. Some of you don't know much about it. Many of you know a lot about it. So, um, shall we start with the reading of the text first? And then we will look into the system and then we see what Sri Aurobindo adds to it from the essays on the Gita. Yeah? If you want to say something, you unmute yourself. I can see that, Marta, you want to say something? No? Yeah? So, no, please... No, un- thank you. I, I just was reaching for this book. <laughs> All right, right. Thank you. Yes, the same book, only differently printed, yes, here online. Okay, let's start with these, starting from 21. We stopped at 20, number 20. Om, I will take number 20 with me as a connection to the next. Om na jayate mriyate va. Kadachit, this is Trishtup. Um, um, okay. Um, Najayate Maria Teva Kadachit, Nayam Bhutva Bhavita Vana Bhuya, Ajonit Yak Shashvato Yam Purano, Nahanyate Hanyamane Shari Re. Veda vinashinam nityam ya enam ajam avyayam katham sapurushav partha kam ghata eti hantikam vasan si jirnani yatha vihaya navani gruhnati naroparani tatha sharirani vihaya jirnan yanyani samyati navani de Nainam chindanti shastrani, nainam dahati pavaka, Nachainam kledayant yapu, Nasho shayeti maruta, Achid yoyam adah yoyam, Akled yo shoshya evacha, Nityak sarvagatav stanur, Achalo yam sanatanaham, Avyakto yam machent yoyam, Avikar yoyam uchyate, Tasmad evam viditvainam nanu shojitum arhasi. Okay, I will stop here, five shlokas, and translate them and look into their meaning. So we, the last shloka we read was, he is not born ever and never dies. And, and there will be an uh, ayam bhutva and having become, he will never there will be never time where he will not be. Um, unborn, constant, ancient, um, sempiternal, as she been translated, Shashvatach. Nahan yatehan yamane sharire. He is not killed in the body which is killed. Today I got a glimpse why Sri Krishna speaks to Arjuna in this way. <laughs> which I never had before, so to say. Why to appeal to him that he cannot destroy the real thing? Mm -hmm. It seems, 
that uh, it is im important for him to know about this. Yeah. For some reason, it is important for Arjuna to know that he cannot kill or destroy the real behind this appearance, behind the phenomenal world. Because somehow he may get that idea that he can damage something here. He can damage the procedure, the process, the evolution, something he will be a cause for destruction in some way. But he has to know that nothing can be destroyed here. It's only in the flux of constant change. And that's why Sri Krishna insists so much at the beginning about this, that he is not born, never dies. And having become, there will be never time he will not be. He wants to bring him this idea that he actually cannot do much. He cannot really influence <laughs> much of this process of uh, development, which Krishna already determined which the presence of consciousness is already determining the whole prakriti to move. If we analyze kind of deeply without much of the thinking, without mind being active, what is really happening in our life, we can see that whatever happens in this life is somehow implies consciousness behind it, present, present witness in everything. If that witness withdraws, everything collapses. There is nothing to, to really to be or to achieve. There would be nothing moving here in this world. The moment presence is here, everything moves, everything struggles, fights, um, continuously is being destroyed and being altered. So we have that movement because of the consciousness witnessing it. Today, um, I also had this glimpse by reading Sri Aurobindo that that presence of the witness in everything, in plants, animals, in their relations, in, in, uh, in stones and stars and galaxies, there is a constant presence of some consciousness behind, which allows all these movements to take place. As uh, in, our, <laughs> in our session, uh, Dr. Basso, uh, Sumitra Basso asked, uh, but why electron is moving around proton? <laughs> this is a good question. Why did he decide to move <laughs> around proton? <laughs> this is uh, really a question. Why not to stop, but to move? We think about it as mechanical. It's not mechanical. It's in a way consciousness behind it, which makes it move around the proton, around the nuclear. So that's what he wants to bring to him, that particular consciousness, which is present behind everything and is not, he cannot alter it or destroy it. Veda vinashinam nityam, know it as indestructible. So, oh, sorry, yeah, the one who knows it as indestructible, uh, as unborn, as imperishable, avyayam, katham saparushav partha kam ghatayati ghantikam. How can such purusha kill anyone or order to kill anyone? There is no way he can do it. The moment he realizes how this prakriti is functioning, Vasansi Jirnani Yatha Vihaya, as the man drops worn out garments, Navani Grihnati Naroparani, and takes new garments. In the same way, man drops his worn out bodies and takes new bodies in a new reincarnation. Nainam Chindanti Shastrani, him the weapons cannot cut. You cannot with your swords and uh, spears cut him or penetrate him. Nainam dahati pavaka, and the fire cannot burn him. Nainam 
and the waters do not moisten him, and the winds do not dry him. He is uncuttable, or indestructible. Adahyo, he is, um, cannot be burned. <laughs> Akledio, he cannot be moistened. Ashoshia evacha, and cannot be dried up. Nityach, constant, sarvagatach. Omnipresent, stanuch, stable. Achalach, immobile. Ayam sanatanach, this eternal. Excuse me. Yeah. Yes. But all of these attributes, um, uh, uh, which are mentioned here in this loka, mm -hmm. uh, for which is the subject? Because I try to find the subject, but I, I don't find which word precisely is used for the subject. The subject is that you cannot kill him who he is here. You can destroy the body, which will be destroyed anyhow by by the cause of time. But the real one, you cannot kill. So you don't yes, need to yes, suffer. I, I, I understand, but I don't find the, the word in this loka. The when word? It's mentioned, the word. The, if they are talking about the, as you say, Purusha, but I didn't find it in which, which place and with which word is using the subject of all these attributes? Uh, that, uh, we know him, he is not born. It's about him, yeah? Who knows him as... as um, yes, but always is indirect. I try to find the, the um, objectively the subject of all of these attributes. You need a subject, yeah? <laughs> By the <laughs> no, way... It's not necessary. By the way, the Sanskrit can be used without the subject. Yeah? You can use one verb, a verb, saying, for example, gachati, griham gachati, and that would mean that he goes home, or one goes home, one. The subject is one in this case. Yeah? English one, abstract one. One cannot be destroyed. One cannot be... Uh, burnt and so on. Yeah, yes. Could there be anything that's not the subject, I would ask? <laughs> yes. <right. laughs> so if subject is not defined, most probably it is everywhere, in everyone. Yes, very good point, actually. And a very good point that the subject is not mentioned, that he, that one, cannot be destroyed, and this can, <laughs> or you cannot be destroyed, and everybody else can. There is no kind of definition of the someone who can or cannot be destroyed. It's the one. Uh, in, in, uh, in the other uh, Bhagavad Gita book with commentary by Sri Aurobindo, on verse 18, it says, these bodies of the embodied one, capital O. So there's your, your one uh -huh, uh -huh. you're looking for. The embodied, Dehin. It's also interesting. The one who has the body, that is the definition. <laughs> so you see, <clears throat> he has no name, as it were. Hi, this is Lakshman. Hi, Lakshman. Yeah. To me, the whole purpose of evolution is to unite with the subject. Yes. Yes. It's Absolutely. No subject is everywhere. So that's the whole goal of evolution. The goal of individual evolution or collective evolution is to unite with the subject. It's right. Not, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, subject is the the true one, the true the true being behind everything. Which is a, yes, true consciousness. So the one, he, that true subject, the one who really is, he drops these clothes, these bodies, like the one drops the worn-out cloth. He cannot be 
penetrated by the sword. He cannot be burned by the fire. He cannot be, sorry, pierced by the sword, burned by the fire, moistened by the waters, or dried by the wind. Uh, he is constant, omnipresent, stable, immobile, eternal. Avyaktoyam, he is unmanifest. Achintyoyam, he is unthinkable. That's more, most probably the, the reason why there is no name. He is unthinkable. <laughs> you cannot really think of him. The moment you start thinking of him, you think about one of his manifestations. Avicario, he is not mutable, not possible to distort or to, 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 uh, to uh, don't know, uh, mutilate, huh? Engage. Yes, uh, Im immutable, Shabindo translates here. Yeah. Vikara is actually distortion, cannot be the subject of any distortion or modification. You cannot modify him, distort him, or put him into some kind of use, because he is not the object, he is the subject. Tasmat evam viditvainam nanushochitam arhasi. And therefore, knowing him as such, you should not suffer. Why should you suffer about him? This is a kind of uh, quite solid proof that you should not suffer about the one who is um, who is beyond everything. Atachainam nityajatam, and now he shifts uh, to his level slowly from that higher level to Arjuna's level. And even if you consider him to be constantly born. Nityam vaman yasem ritam, and if even you consider him constantly dying, tathapitvam mahabaho naivam shochitomarhasi, even then you don't need to suffer about him. If he is constantly being born and constantly dying, <laughs> why to suffer about him even then? He will be born again and will die again. So. So he is widening the scope of time for Arjuna. Arjuna is too put himself too narrow to this particular event, and then suddenly he sees the bigger picture of the whole of the whole life. Jatasya hi druvam rityur druvam janmam ritasya cha tasmata parihar yerthe natvam shoche tomarasi. If you consider him, he is of the one who is born the death is certain, and of the one who is dead, the birth is certain. And if these are not avoidable, inevitable, then why do you suffer at all? Avyaktadini Bhutani, and he continues, the same idea. Uh, at the beginning, all the beings are unmanifest. Vyakta Madhyani Bharata, and they are all manifested in the middle. Avyaktani Dhanan Yeva, at the end they are again unmanifest. Tatrakapari Devana, what is the grief of it? Why to grieve about it? It is like this for everyone and for everything in time and space. Ascharyavat pashyati kashchidenam, ascharyavat vadati tathai vajanyach, ascharyavat chainam anyach shrenoti shrutva pienam vedana chaiva kashchid. This is trishtup, the change of the meter. Uh, one sees it as a mystery, or one speaks of it, or hears of it as a mystery, but non, none knows it. So I will translate literally, Asharyavat, as a mystery, Pashyati, one sees, again one, uh, 
someone. Someone sees. Kashchit someone. Enam him. Ashtaryavat vadati. Someone speaks about him, about him with kind of the sense of federation or mystery. Ashtaryavat chainam and somebody hears or comprehends his presence within our life. And having that revelation or that inspiration. Nobody knows him here. So we can have only notice, seeing, hearing, speech. The faculties will bring some, something for us to be in contact with his presence in us. But to know him by these faculties is impossible. It reminds me of Kena Upanishad, yes, that through the faculties you cannot know him. It is, it is he who is present when the faculties are activated. When we see here, it is his presence which is determining these activities of the faculties. So they cannot see him, know him. We can have a glimpse of him through seeing, a glimpse for, of him for, through hearing or through the word. When we are inspired by some speech, by some higher word, as we are reading the Gita now, that is the higher, the word of the divine. And it is inspiring us. But can we know him really? As Sri Aurobindo says, but who has seen the body of the king? Nobody has seen the body of the king, capital K. Who had seen the God actually directly <laughs> embodied here? So we do not know him totally. He is a mystery anyway. Dehi nityam avadhyoyam dehe sarvasya Bharata. A bit louder. Tasmat sarvani bhutani natvam shochetumar hasi. They, the embodied one, nityam avadhyoyam, is constantly indestructible. Or dehe. Uh, Sarvasya Bharata, in the body of everyone, he is indestructible. Therefore, Tasmat Sarvani Bhutani Natvam Shochito Marhasi, you should not suffer, you should not grieve about any of these becomings. They are all coming from him, projected from him, and drawn back to him. Once the forms appeared, they lived, they embodied his presence and they withdraw to him. So why to suffer this process? It is like this. Now there is a shift here from 31. I will stop here before 31. Because that's the part which I want to look into today, Prakriti and Purusha, Purusha and Prakriti. Behind every movement of Prakriti, there is the presence of the Spirit, a constant witness. So I um, have this presentation on Sankhya. For some of you, it is absolutely unnecessary because you know Sankhya very well and Indian philosophy. By the way, I must say that Sankhya became the foundation for all darshanas, not only for Sankhya, but also for yoga, for Vaisheshika, for Vedanta, yes, uh, for Nyaya. Sankhya is implied everywhere. So to say we can, con we can consider Sankhya to be the beginning of the mental structure of consciousness. And I will explain why. Because manas, sense mind, is operational. It's the operator uh, through which indriyas, the senses, operate. And that is the mental structure. In the 
Vedanta in the ancient Upanishads, it's not the case. Manas is one of the faculties. It is not a sixth faculty. It is not the faculty which is operating through the other faculties. It is one of them, equal to speech, to hearing, seeing, is one of those faculties. But later in Sankhya, with the beginning of mental structure, we have this shift. And actually, we can find this shift in all cultures. In Greek philosophy, we find it uh, with Socrates coming and saying that now I, I don't need to believe in your myths. I, I can measure and discover the truth of, by myself, by my own mind. So this was the shift. You, we can see it in Buddhism. We can see it in, uh, in all these um, new religions. Taoism, Jainism, all of them started approximately the same time, 500, 500 BC. There was a shift in consciousness, big shift towards mental structure. Um, here, if you look at it, we could see that there are two major components, Purusha and Prakriti. According to Sankhya, to the original system, Purusha and Prakriti are two infinite beings coexisting eternally. So Purusha attends to Prakriti. Prakriti is in constantly in equilibrium. There is no difference between Rajas, Tamas and Sattva. Um, this is uh, from the previous presentations of mine, uh, which are actually on other topics, but I take only Sankhya here for a few slides of Sankhya, which I would like to... You know, your slides aren't showing, Vladimir, if you had some slides up, I wasn't sure. Oh. Only your verse, the Gita verses are showing only. Oh, oh so sorry. I will have... Thank you for telling me this. Otherwise, I thought it was there. And now... Yeah. You can see, yeah? Yes. I was talking on this slide. <laughs> that was a long speech about this slide. So if you look at this, Purusha and Prakriti, two major uh, eternal beings which never die. There are many Purushas according to the traditional Sankhya, to the classical sans Sankhya. And there is one Prakriti, one nature. So many Purushas are our souls who are attending to Prakriti, and once they attend to her, pay attention to her, she starts kind of mixing her Rajas, Tamas, and Sattva Gunas, which are otherwise in equilibrium. When Purusha does not attend to them, they fall into equilibrium. She dissolves herself. She is no more active. But the moment he attends to her, they are mm, building up something. They are mixing up. And so the first mixture is buddhi, the pure reason, the higher reason, the reason or the mind beyond senses, as it is described in this system. Then we have ahankara, the ego sense, uh, the poise or in nature of our souls. Actually, it's Purusha is creating that shadow, as it were, drops the shadow into Prakriti, which immediately creates the ahankara. And then the sense mind, as the representative of that ahankara, involves itself with indriyas. And there are five indriyas, jnanendriyas, uh, the indriyas of knowledge, hearing, touch, sight, taste, and smell, five karmendriyas, indriyas or senses of action, vaj, uh, uh, speech, hands, legs, procreatory, excretory organs, and there are five uh, great elements, panchamaha bhutani, uh, akasha, or ether, air, fire, water, and earth. Notice how beautifully they correspond. And there are five Tan Matras. For those who are interested uh, to go deeper, we can look into all of them. But it's not our purpose here. Our purpose is to see the system. And these 25 Tattvas are the system of Sankhya. These are irreducible elements. You cannot reduce hearing to some other 
more essential element. You cannot really use touch or sight or taste or smell to smaller elements. Um, you cannot really use for or prakriti <laughs> to any other element. So they are irreducible tattvas, and they are 25. If you count them, 5, 5, 5, 20, and these five, Purusha, Prakriti, Buddha, Hamkara, and Manas. And that is the system of Sankhya. Amazing, yeah? Simplistic in a way. From the first sight, you don't even see much from here. You think, oh, it's lovely. All right, it should be like there's something. It's very mental, as it were. But the deeper we look, we will see that it is not just uh, the mental uh, formulation. I, it is much more. It has a merit behind it. So, oops. But, but uh, Vladimir, the, the Purushas here that are many this is you you mentioned the soul but it, it really wouldn't be the soul as we often think about it as the a divine spark uh from from the divine or from brahman i mean it's a different different uh connotation uh or definition of the soul and my question would be if we start with purusha with all these many Purushas, where, where does Sankhya say they come from? Right. So Sankhya does not answer this question. By the way, Sankhya is considered to be atheistic theory or darshan. Atheistic. There is no God here. There are many Purushas. <laughs> many selves which exist by themselves and cannot be destroyed, cannot disappear. They are eternal, infinite. And the same, there is one infinite Prakriti. And that is the drawback of the classical san Sankhya. In the, in the Gita, it is pre-classical Sanskrit. And that's what Sri Aurobindo will be speaking in this Sankhya and Yoga chapter. He will say that there is one, there is another Purusha behind the many Purushas. There is a Purusha involved in Prakriti. There is Purusha not involved in Prakriti, many of them. And there is someone who is beyond both, Purushottama. And that is the Sankhya of the Gita. Sankhya of the Gita accepts all these, plus it adds another dimension of Purushottama behind. The, yeah. All right, um, that's basically it. If you have more questions, so please. If not, I will jump back to the, what I wanted to read from Sri Aurobindo on the essays on the Gita, and then we will open for discussions on this particular topic, on Furusha and Prakriti, because it's essential, it's fundamental to integral yoga and to any other yoga, by the way, uh, to... So separation of Purusha from Prakriti is considered to be Mukti. That is the ideal of liberation. Once Purusha is um, free from Prakriti, from engagement into Prakriti, he is aware of his own self, then the Mukti is done. <laughs> he is free. By the way, Sri Aurobindo had his own method, which we can mention here. Before he met the mother, he did this yoga of separation of Purusha from Prakriti, by the way. That is yoga of Sri Aurobindo before he met the mother. When he met the mother, his yoga considerably changed. And we can speak about that also for some who are interested about it. So before he was... He was instructed by Vishnu Bhaskar Lele, who was his teacher, to, to separate Purusha from Prakriti in a particular fashion. He had to sit down and to observe his thoughts. Observe them without being engaged in them. This is a very interesting kind of technique because once you are not engaged in the activities of prakriti which is constantly generating thinking 
you are just observing these, this activity, being not engaged, you are slowly separating something in you, some observer, some witness within you, who is gradually becoming free from her uh, imprisonment of Purusha's attention. She needs his attention to function. But the moment you start observing them without being engaged, without following any thought, so you can see how thoughts move, but you are not thinking them. You see what they bring, but you are not being taken by them. You let them move their own way. So they enter into your field and they move. And so in three days, Sri says he mastered that. And then he felt that his consciousness was rising higher and higher and stood high above the head. And from that height, he could clearly see our thoughts are entering into his field, mental field, from outside. One thought, then the other thought. They were concrete. They were concrete invaders <laughs> into his field <laughs> from outside. And he brushed them away. He didn't allow them to enter. And then he says, when he kept that space empty of thoughts, there was the descent of their higher peace. The, the silent Brahman descended upon him. And that there was a change. That was the great change of where well, Sri to experience the silent Brahman or Nirvana consciousness. Nirvana means silence, actually, where there are no thoughts. Or there are thoughts, but they are, as Sri Aurobindo describes them, they are like the birds flying through the windless air. So he is identified with this windless air through which these you know, birds are flying without disturbing the air at all. So this is the achievement of this separation of Purusha from Prakriti. And he says it is needed to appreciate what Prakriti does for us, how she acts, because only then we can be truly masters of Prakriti and whatever she does. So here I want um, us yeah. to look... Yeah. Can I make a question? Yes, please. Then, the, um, w when you say the, the separation between Prakriti and Purusha, it's like uh, um, you are Purusha, this, this, uh, this, this attach of the Prakriti. Yes. You remain, you remain as a Purusha with without attachments, isn't it? Yes. You are here, but you, are, you have no attachment to anything what Prakriti does. Shibindu describes this also as, you see yourself as in a movie. It's another. You see the movie, you are there in the movie, <laughs> moving one of the subjects with other subjects. Thank you. It goes that, that far. <laughs> Um, Vivekananda beautifully describes this as the surface of the huge ocean. And if you look into the depth of the ocean and the, the weeds of the ocean, you could, you could perceive that vastness as tangible, uh, substantial, deep peace. That is the nirvanic consciousness. There is no wave on the surface of this infinite ocean. If that can be imaginable, then that is that. Yes, but, no, yes, yes, Bill. But uh, say Prakriti is the ocean and I'm a wave on the ocean. <laughs> And I look to the, I heard this before and I like it, but okay. I'm trying to maybe, you know, I look at, I look at the wave next to me and I say, how are you doing wave? You know, it's good to see you. Good morning. 
And, um, and I ask you this other wave next to me, have you ever heard of this thing called the ocean? They say it's beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've heard someday that, you know, we're just going to go and go and go and we'll crash and, you know, we'll hit the shore and we'll be no more, you know, you and I will be no more. And I, but I hope someday that I get to see this ocean, I get to know it. And I'm wondering if that, so it's kind of like saying the Purushas are many waves and the property might be the ocean in this case. How, or am I way off on this? Is that, yes. I don't know it, if I'm uh, This is a beautiful metaphor, yes, yeah. about the waves and the ocean and, and the waves can also splash into one another, you know, they can disappear before coming to the shore. <laughs> Like, um, so you may have many different perceptions of this one who is always there. So once they splash, you go back to that surface, which is never splashing. And you're, you're constantly there. Your consciousness is there in the depth of the ocean. You know? Whatever currents it has, whatever the waves on the surface, still you are that very thing cannot cannot change it that one can no one can destroy or change or alter it is always there even the ocean is another kind of formation of a particular self or a higher self or universal self because there can be just oceans infinite oceans or not one ocean Maybe we are within one ocean, within one galaxy somewhere, within one system. Yeah. And that's what we call Paramatman or something. I didn't want to go to, the, uh, to that uh, kind of comparison, but I just mentioned uh, from Vivekananda how he experienced Nirvana as the, as the infinite ocean without any turbid wave. So he... Um, Separation of Purusha from Prakriti is essential for yoga, essential for Gita, essential for uh, integral yoga. As Shubindu says, it is the first step. The first step is the liberation. And the next, there will be more steps. You know, then we have to come back, being free to come back to Prakriti and engage with her uh, with um, self-awareness of Purusha. Um, there is another passage which I wanted to quote here before I stop. And this is the one from Sankhya and Yoga. And I would recommend um, to all of us to read these chapters, especially this one. It's a bit longer, but truly speaking, take it bit by bit. Read only bits you which go in and then continue next time or something. Or we can also read together, which would be very useful for all of us. The first important new element we find is the conception of Purusha itself. This is in the chapter two. He brings him this idea of the one who is always there behind all the movements of Prakriti. Prakriti conducts her activities for the pleasure of Purusha. But how is that pleasure determined? In the strict Sankhya analysis, it can only be by passive consent of silent witness. Consent or attention. He pays attention to her. Passively, the witness consents to the action of the intelligent will and the ego sense. Passively, he consents to the recoil of that will from the ego sense. He is witness, source, and the consent, source of the consent by reflection, upholder of the work of nature, Sakshi, Anumanta, Bharata, but nothing more. But the Purusha of the Gita is also the Lord of nature. He is Ishvara. If the operation of the intelligent will belongs to nature. The origination and power of the will proceed from the conscious soul. 
He is the Lord of nature. If the act of intelligence of the will is the act of prakriti, the source and light of the intelligence are actively contributed by the Purusha. He is not only the witness, but the Lord and knower, master of knowledge and will, Jnata Ishvara. He is the supreme cause of the action of Prakriti, the supreme cause of its withdrawal from action also. In the Sankhya analysis, Purusha and Prakriti in their dualism are the cause of the cosmos. In this synthetic Sankhya, Purusha, by his Prakriti, is the cause of the cosmos. This is something which we have to, to see, the difference between traditional classical Sankhya and Sankhya of the Gita. And the whole chapter is dedicated to this, yeah? to see that uh, the Purusha is not only the Sakshi, the witness, he is also Anumanta, the sanctioner of the movements of Prakriti. And Shubindu describes how it is happening. Once you have that Sakshi freed, once you have, we have that Mukti, we can see what happens. And Shubindu himself experienced this in his life when he became first liberated. He saw himself as the, in the movie. There were no thoughts. He said, I have no thoughts. When I had to go to this meeting in a Surat, <laughs> he complained to his teacher saying, what should I say to people? I have no thoughts. <laughs> Thought. And teacher told him, don't worry. Thoughts will come. In the moment they are needed, they will come. Because Prakriti will be acting. So the thoughts will be offered to you. The words will be offered and you will have only to select them in a particular manner and let them do the work. This is the liberated state. And for months, he says, he was in that state, like in the movie. And then, he says, slowly things started to come back. Like, but they came and occupied the right place. They were no more mixed up. So to say, they were not misunderstood. So there was a development of Anumanta, of the one who sanctions the movements of Prakriti. And he noticed that Purusha is not only observing uh, and witnessing, he is also sanctioning the movements of Prakriti. Prakriti offers to Purusha saying, let us say this. And you can say yes or no to that movement of thought or feeling. And if Purusha says yes, Prakriti does it. If Purusha says no, Prakriti drops it. Even if it is very attractive for Prakriti, she wants to do it. She likes it. But she will drop it. Because there is no sanction from Purusha. And this, is, this uh, process may also be visible in the evolution of our nature. We can see many times that Prakriti develops one particular branch of development and then she drops it for some reason. It didn't work out something. You know, experiment. She experiments with, with the possibilities. She tries this, tries that, organizes one particular society, capitalistic, communistic. She tries, sees how it doesn't work, learns from it. And something is going on, something is continuously, we are acquiring new qualities or consciousness within the nature by these processes of uh, drawing back and coming in and dropping and succeeding. And many times uh, failures are the, the best ways to learn, much better than successes. It doesn't matter whether she succeeds or fails. Matters that we learn, that we grow in consciousness. That's what matters. 
The consciousness penetrates deeper into the nature, into all her movements. So he becomes Anumanta, the one who gives Anumati, the sanction to Prakriti. This is yes, this is not. He becomes conscious, chooser of whatever is to be done. And then he grows into what is called Ishvara. He becomes the Lord. He and she, Prakriti, becomes his Shakti. So Ishvara and Shakti. There is no more separation between him and her. She is him and he is her. And this is the aim of this uh, evolution. That's where we are moving and we are heading at. And this this is our purpose. Sorry, Vladimir, I have some questions. One, one of them is uh, Purusha remains always passive. And the other one, when you say Shakti, him and her are together, are together no, again so pra uh, Prakriti and Purusha, or he, he, he and, her and she are not Prakri Prakriti and Purusha? Sorry, I know. I don't know if By the way, mother, mother went so far, she didn't like this uh, Purusha Prakriti business <laughs> and this separation, you know, she actually, because people tried to, to separate Purusha from Prakriti in terms of like marriage, you know, I'm Purusha, you're Prakriti. So um, Prakriti is like, she this said that. Like yeah, it's, it's, not it's like this. No. When you say Shakti is. Um, Shakti is his force, his will, his nature. But his you say it's power. something together, but this yeah. is not. Yes, they're absolutely together from the beginning. You know that she's his power, Chit Shakti. Chit Shakti is inbuilt, Shakti. intrinsic, intrinsic in the being, in Sat. How, of course, in this manifestation, they are separated for the sake of, you know, for the sake of the play or ma manifestation of uh, multitude creation. So in that way, they are separated. But um, that we become aware of different elements within him. But truly speaking, she is his power and consciousness. Yes, Marta. I was just thinking about how... Um in Sankhya, it seems that they, they are more separate than in Sri Aurobindo's yoga. And he sees them, I, I, I've, with, I'm, it's brought to my mind about how in the synthesis of yoga, Sri Aurobindo writes about soul and nature seeming to be in opposition to each other. And then he makes a synthesis wherein they're not really a duality but they are, they are, are one in, in two elements of one, one reality in that uh, when soul is master of nature and they're in their proper positions, there's no, no opposition to them. So yes. I think uh, in reflecting on soul and nature, Purusha and Prakriti, um, I find this very helpful to, to, to think of the synthesis that that he makes in that way. Yeah. This is, a, in other words, I was talking about the synthesis here that he slowly from being separated and he's in his experience, they are coming slowly back to, to be one again. And that's what happened in his yoga with the mother. Yes, thank you. Yes, Nomi. <laughs> So I'm just... Yes, go ahead. Oh, me. Um, I was just reflecting on um, kind of carrying the image of the electrons and the protons mm -hmm. and was wondering if we could possibly say that Purusha and Prakriti are separated so that we understand and re or so that we realize and witness Drishti as the important factor to cause action whether it's through like, you know, global or universal thought shifts, as you were talking about Sri Aurobindo, seeing the thoughts moving through his field and being able to push them away. But we see globally kind of similar structures or similar ideologies that kind of shift 
all within the same hundred years or so. We also see it in terms of fads. And then I was thinking of balance in this kind of relationship of drishti as being constant motion. And the way to have the constant motion is the uh, revolution of uh, movement around a stable point. And it's sort of magnetism being this drishti, this vision. Um, lovely, lovely thoughts, yes. Nature, nature replicates the same relations with mm -hmm. <laughs> In, uh, in the nuclear and the electron, you know, electron is moving around. Look at solar systems, at uh, galaxies, everywhere. We have some nuclear around which there is some movement is taking place. Some field is being built. And we can experience it just like when you've been to the place in Angel Fire, when you're just looking out onto an autumn afternoon or a winter afternoon. And what you witness is this ebb and flow of organisms all communicating. And some are communicating with different organisms, cross organisms, and some are communicating within their own organism. Um, but it's like, they're all moving, but they're all listening to the same band. Like they're all moving with this sense of cohesion where the deer walks noticeably different in autumn than the deer walks in winter. Their spacing between each other is different. The pace is different. The stride is different. Everything is different. Mm -hmm. But they're always communicating um, with the whole. And that mm -hmm. ebb and flow goes with seasons or drought cycles or trees dying. So, you know, we have aspens. And of course, they're single organisms that are coming out of you know, one root. So a tree maybe 150 years old, but the system is thousands of years old, or in Utah, 80,000 years old. But it's an ebb and flow of, of life that we're constantly seeing. There's a stasis that is a sameness. And then everything is sort of a branch or, um, mm -hmm. you know, melody or harmony lines around that. Beautiful. I can see that that kind of feel like what uh, this consciousness is present everywhere and it reorganizes all the relations in the moment wherever there is a shift of the season or uh, the new time or new space and consciousness is still present and organizing and harmonizing all the communications and relations between the smallest and the biggest elements, always holding everything within this harmonious realm. No? This is this is the presence of Purusha, his witness within the Prakriti as the power which is doing all the work, but the awareness is his. Beautiful. Thank you, Noam. It's beautiful what you described. It's really to the point of that. Uh, it's difficult to, to, we have to deviate, come to, to our life and see how it really works there. Yeah in order to, to have an experience of it. Is there a practical impulsion or an implication? Like, uh, because initially we all uh, experience Purusha and Prakriti as kind of, uh, there is a separation, but at what point do they kind of join? Like it becomes Ishwara and Shakti, like at what point it becomes united? Like what's the impulsion behind that? Like just the consciousness and we watching that as the witness consciousness or there is something else behind? I think it is the process of our us becoming self-aware of that being in us, which is unborn self. Yes, And in that process of becoming self-aware, we... Purusha and Prakriti are one from the beginning. You know, that's the problem for us. We see it as different. And be, because we see it so, as uh, Naomi was saying, that, that seeing it as such creates the world. And what the soul envisions is made the world. That is the line from Savitri. Whatever soul sees, the world will become. So um, the Purusha sees it in this way, Prakriti will do it. So as long as we see it in this way, it will be separate, it will be different, it will be, we will be many, we will not be one. 
but the, the process, once I become unborn uh, in my consciousness, that's, and then I come back and see that how I sanction everything here in my life, and then I become one with my own nature, then my unborn self becomes one with my becoming nature. What, what do we know about that? <laughs> I could say, um, to this point, I ask myself, well, Krishna just gave Arjuna all the knowledge. That's mm. it. You got it. But I'm standing on the battlefield still looking at Krishna saying, I hear it and I get it, but I don't get it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I, I think I need another chapter. Definitely. We need many more chapters, many more times. Yes, definitely. So, yeah, many more uh, If I could just, you know, have my enlightenment, I have the knowledge here, so I could just take my enlightenment now, and, but no. For some, and I had this experience where on s Saturday night, I took Sarah to drive up to Asheville to see some snow, and on the way back, there was a homeless man on the sidewalk and he had a little blanket and it was very cold and he was rubbing his dog and, uh, and my heart broke and I had to come home and get a big comforter and some dog food and some bologna. And I'm thinking, don't grieve for anybody for the living or the dead, Bill, don't <laughs> grieve, don't mourn. And here I am sobbing almost for this homeless man. And I'm thinking, what's enough? Can I bring him back to the house? Do I need to pay rent? Can I save all the homeless people tonight that are going to freeze to death? And, uh, and then I was humbled, right? Because it's easy to sit here and, and get lofty and go into meditation. But, but uh, I was shown a lesson. I thought I would share that. So, so I need another chapter of Vladimir, please. <laughs> I think Lakshman would like to say something. Yes, Lakshman. Yeah, I don't see. Talking about grieving, like he said with the homeless, we talk in the chapter, uh, the slokas that we read earlier. When I was a teenager, 16, 70, one of my classmates got into an accident he was on a on a moped, and his his brain was badly damaged. He was in a coma. We could go sit in the hospital with him and then he passed away. So it was just first time was something jarring or shocking because it was a young person like myself. So the mother then explained that his psychic being had come to her and said that this body is not going to be adequate for it to continue its uh, experience in this birth. So he'll have to withdraw. So that's how she explained it. And subsequently, I should say that when you grieve, you're not allowing the psychic being to go unattached to its own abode. But more importantly, the vital being and the mental being, which needs to be dissolved when they get to the abode, the attachment drags the vital, uh, vital being to stay around. And sometimes it can enter in somebody else's. Guardian. An example was that also there was another gentleman, Tara, if you know Tara, Tara's yeah. brother. He was diabetic and suddenly died literally young, young age. And the room he, stay, he used to stay in was then given to another friend of ours. And initially he would see sort of ghost of the Narendra who lived there. So he went to the mother and then mother said, I'll take care of it. So she then made it possible for the vital being to move on, you know. So this grieving that uh, what it does is basically clings on to things that have no, no purpose. Yeah, it's mainly vi vital emotions here, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it is ironic that in India, where all of the scriptures are written, it has become now fashionable to hire criers, professional criers. So you <laughs> like really, you really grieve with this person. You know, public has to know that you really love this person, regardless of what. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody would notice. Yeah. <laughs> no, the country that has defined uh, 
Purusha, Prakriti, all of this evolution life cycle, and you have traditions that have absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with that reality, you know, the true reality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this grieving is a, is a mixed emotion. Right? It's mixed with psychic. Psychic uh, is very intense. And for the vital, it is sometimes unbearable. When it comes to true, pure emotion, to true love from the heart, the, the vital breaks with tears or, you know, becomes... I, I was When I started my yoga, I was the same kind of uh, all the time. I'm nowadays also crying anytime, easily, uh, when there is a very intense emotion. So... Um, especially on the higher kind of uh, some higher purpose or some higher concept or meaning of life. And I see it like you were describing, it would be very touching me and definitely as did touch you because there is some truth in hidden in small things, which we recognize. And, um, you know, Vivekananda was the same. He was talking about Pua Narayana all the time, that he would give his heart to this Pua Narayana. Pua Narayana for him was Indian. Indian who is standing Pua there, who needs help, and nobody helps him. So he felt so much that love from the heart. Uh, So it's not a, a small thing. It's a very intense emotion which is coming from the psychic. And the vital hijacks it and starts kind of building a sentiment around it. I noticed that the vital is weak and the psychic is strong and pure. Yeah. And when they meet, then we have this collision, these tears, these emotions and so on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, Mother describes this very beautifully in, in the case even of Ramakrishna. Somebody asked her why Ramakrishna is dancing and singing and crying, and she said he has, you know, in, he indulges in, in in the vital sense. So there is a true movement within him which a vital hijacks and starts indulging, yeah? making some kind of presentation by itself, which which is very sophisticated and very attractive for the vital. But then it feels emotion, it feels important, it feels that life is filled with some meaning, some deeper meaning. And it is true, life is filled with deeper meaning of the psychic true emotion. But the vital cannot handle it and starts weeping, starts uh, behaving strangely. I didn't, I didn't weep or cry when my parents passed away. But I couldn't stop crying when I heard the mother had passed away. Mm. I was in in, in Chicago. When that I, is that is something. Yes, I, well, uncontrollable. Yeah. Right. That is the yeah vital cannot handle this emotion. Yes, it is too much. And we and mother says we have to purify and to train our wife to to be very strong. Yeah, to allow these strong emotions to come through. Otherwise, vital will stop and hijack it. And I, I notice this in my life. You know, so I'm just sharing with you my thoughts on it, you know, which, uh, which may be useful. That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, but still I'm weeping anytime when I see something meaningful <laughs> happening in life. <laughs> It somehow it's to when you see the true movement of consciousness in the situation where it was, it, you understand that all the obstacles are actually calling for this true moment to appear. You understand that obstacles and uh, resistance of the darker forces are only for one thing to invoke this truer power within us. For example, um, which I couldn't uh, I give one example of the, and maybe we'll stop this, that's about the vital again. In the concentration camps, in the gulags in Soviet Union, there were many concentration camps. People were taken into them and they were working hard in the forests, cutting forests in the minus 50 degrees Celsius. And... Um, living without any any 
uh, normal food or normal shelter in the barracks there, which will be which were windy and so on. And uh, one great pianist, and the best people were put into those gulags, really good artists, poets, pianists, you know, musicians. And one great pianist was there, one lady. And she says she, she was so great that uh, all these uh, uh, criminals, which were sitting together with polit political ones, were loving her and created for her piano. Piano, they cut with the, from the wood, they created a piano for her to play. Of course, there was no sound. There were only those, uh, you know, uh, wooden <laughs> notes which she could press. And when she, she was sitting and playing that piano, they all were sitting around and listening to her music. And they swear they heard the music. Now, what, what else can you wish for the divine to appear? What, what, what a great opportunity for the greatest of the deepest of the highest to come through. So the, the opposite is created. Try me. See, can you do it? And it, the soul could do it. So this is a great opportunity for us. We are in good conditions. We can do much more. <laughs> great. Okay, here yeah, on this, maybe we can stop here for today. Yeah, unless somebody wants to say something, please. I just wanted to share uh, with you guys uh, those two sentences that I came to this week. You may know them. One is from Mother uh, and quite relevant to what we have said today about Prakriti and uh, Purusha. You know, Mother was saying about herself, without him, I do not exist. And without me, he is unmanifest. So that, that, that is a way to put the whole thing, I think, about the... Uh, That's wonderful. Purusha. Thank you. Thank and you. The, the I was other thinking thing, up, but you, you, you remembered it. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. And the other sentence I just uh, uh, read yesterday was about Shrubindo saying, what you believe, you become. So actually, you were just mentioning how the way we look at things make things happen this way. And it's very true, actually. Maybe mm -hmm. one of our biggest concern would be to remember uh, uh, what, what do we choose to look at, what, what how, how do we look at things? This is up to us to decide. And I think uh, it's quite powerful uh, as far as the reality appears to us. Uh, that's what I, want, I wanted to say. Thank but you. Uh, Thank you for and, this. And I, want to, and I want to add that I like your attitude very much, Vladimir. You are inspiring. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is an inspiring topic for all of us, definitely. Um, yeah. Thank you. So I will close. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santo Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makashchit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Hari Om.